We have one last topic in our discussion of how to solve elliptic PDEs using finite difference methods, and that is how do we treat nonlinear terms? So, so far we've been looking at the Poisson equation, Laplace's equation, which are both linear, developing direct and iterative methods for solving such elliptic equations. But in many cases, our equations are nonlinear, and so we want to look at two methods for how to treat those nonlinearities. So, one physical area where nonlinear terms can come in is in fluid mechanics and heat transfer. So we still have the Laplacian operator, del squared u, that governs the diffusion of momentum or diffusion of heat in the fluid mechanical and heat transfer context. Whereas we can also have convection where the fluid is moving, and that of course is moving the fluid and the heat around. So it's being convected and diffused as well. And it turns out that the terms in our partial differential equation that govern the convection are nonlinear. So we do need to understand how to deal with such nonlinear terms. So we'll do that using Picard linearization. It's very straightforward, very simple method, and very effective. And you'll also see why we need to use upwind downwind differencing in the context of Picard linearization. For more general types of nonlinear terms in our partial differential equations, we would use Newton linearization, which we'll also discuss in this video as well. So we're going to look at the 2D steady Burgers equation. For those of you in fluid mechanics and heat transfer, these equations will look very familiar. They're very nearly the steady Navier-Stokes equations that govern fluid mechanics. However, what's missing is there are no pressure terms, which you would normally see here on the right-hand sides of the equation. So it's a simplified version of the full Navier-Stokes equations. But the point is it has the nonlinearity due to these convection terms here on the left-hand side, highlighted in red. You see here the Laplacians of the velocities u and v in the x and y direction respectively on the right-hand side. Again, that governs the diffusion. So it's these convective terms, terms like u partial u partial x, that are nonlinear and we need to be able to treat in order to solve these kinds of equations. Now you notice the nonlinearity is of a very particular form. It's u times partial u partial x, v partial u partial y, u partial v partial x, and v partial v partial y. Again, u is the component of the fluid velocity in the x direction, v is the component of fluid velocity in the y direction. But because these are nonlinear and of a particular form, we can use Picard linearization. It's essentially as follows. Here we have a u times a partial u partial x. All we're going to do is lag the u that multiplies the partial u partial x by one iteration. So in that way, the u that multiplies that first derivative is known, and we've gotten rid of the nonlinearity. So then we can use a central difference approximation or whatever is appropriate for the partial u partial x term. And we'll talk more about that as well. So that's exactly what we do. The u and the v that multiply these first order derivatives we're going to take as known from the previous iteration. So we'll denote those by these starred. So uij star, vij star variables. They're known from the previous iteration. So the remaining unknowns at the current iteration are all linear. So if we take a look at the first of our Burgers equations, we have the Reynolds number, which is just a non-dimensional parameter, and it's known times, we have u times partial u partial x. For now, we're just going to use second order accurate central differences plus v times partial u partial y, again using second order accurate central differences. And then on the right hand side we have the partial squared u partial x squared and the partial squared u partial y squared terms, which as we did before, we'll use second order accurate central differences as well. When we collect all the terms together, recognizing that the uij star and the vij star are known, then we have our finite difference equation. We have everything times ui plus 1j, plus everything times ui minus 1j, plus everything times uij plus 1, everything times uij plus 1, and everything times uij. So that's our typical five-point finite difference stencil. The point itself, uij, north, south, east, and west, as usual. You'll notice if you take the Reynolds number to zero, you get rid of all these terms in red and blue, and you get back the finite difference form of the Laplace equation. Now, as we've seen before, this is all fine, but we need to check whether this is going to converge. Iterating over and over again on this finite difference equation using one of the techniques that we've discussed, whether it's going to converge. So we can check the diagonal dominance in order to see that. So here is that check in this particular slide. I'm not gonna go through the details, it's here. It's also in the book. It turns out that there are very severe restrictions on the size of delta x in order for us to have a diagonally dominant system of equations. Remember the Reynolds number is known. The uij, it's a physical parameter, that's a velocity, 
Here again we have Reynolds number and Vij. So what's happening is we're being forced to choose the numerical parameter delta x relative to these physical parameters, Reynolds number and velocities, and there are two difficulties. The first is, as the Reynolds number gets bigger, so as the Reynolds number here and here get bigger, then the delta x is going to have to keep getting smaller and smaller in order to adhere to these restrictions. So Reynolds number going up, increased nonlinearity, delta x grid size has to be decreased accordingly. The other problem is because the uij and vij star are in this criteria, we would need to know them. Well, we don't know them. That's part of the solution. So that's the second issue that we have is that we do not know the values of the velocity components within the domain. Now, if we look back and see what's happened in terms of losing diagonal dominance, you'll notice in the second order accurate central differences for the first derivatives, we've contributed to the off diagonal terms, the i plus one, and i minus one terms, but not the diagonal term, the i term. And that's precisely the issues. And that's why we have this additional restriction in order to maintain diagonal dominance. So the remedy for this is upwind, downwind differencing. The idea is as follows. It's motivated by our desire to improve the diagonal dominance. So what we'd like to do is whenever we add an additional contribution to the off diagonal terms, we would like to add an equal contribution to the main diagonal terms. The way we do that is through either a backward or a forward difference. And we decide based on the signs because we want to increase the magnitude. So it depends on the signs of the other terms of that same type. And the way it turns out is as follows. If uij star is positive, so if the velocity is to the right, then we'll use a backward difference for that first derivative. So we'll have our uij star again using Picard linearization and then the partial u partial x rather than using a second order accurate central difference approximation we'll use a first order accurate emphasized here backward difference. So that's uij minus ui minus 1j. And what you'll notice if you put this back into the equation taking into account the fact that the uij star is positive we'll have a positive contribution to the main diagonal and we'll have an equal contribution to the off diagonal as well. And in that way, we can maintain diagonal dominance. Carrying that idea forward, when uij star is negative, then we'll have to use a forward difference. So the first derivative will be ui plus 1j minus uij over delta x. Of course, that's still just first order accurate. But once again, we'll have equal contributions to the diagonal and off diagonal terms. We do the same thing with the v terms. So here we have v star partial u partial y. If the v star is positive, we use a backward difference. v star is negative, we use a forward difference. Of course, now in y. So here we have uij minus uij minus 1 over delta y, first order accurate in y. Here we have a uij plus 1 minus uij over delta y. Again, first order accurate in y. So we can once again check for diagonal dominance. It's here, it's in the book, I won't go through the details. What happens is we restore the weak diagonal dominance that we had before in all of these cases using the forward and backward differences appropriately as we discussed. So the point of up and down differencing is to force diagonal dominance. Now it's only weak diagonal dominance, but nevertheless we have a diagonally dominant system, so we would expect that there should not be any mesh restrictions in order to ensure conversions, which is exactly what we would want. That's what we had for the Poisson equation. Now we have that for the Berger's equation as well. Now in terms of how we apply this, the goal is to enhance diagonal dominance. But to be consistent, we will want to apply the up and down and differencing in both of the first order terms, regardless of the direction. So what that means is we're actually going to have four different possibilities. U positive, V positive, U negative, V positive, U negative, V negative, u negative v positive, I'm not sure if I got, but the four possible combinations of u and v being positive and negative. One thing that's important to understand in this approach is, is that we have linearized the difference equation using Picard linearization, not the differential equation. In other words, we're still solving the nonlinear partial differential equation. We still have those u partial u partial x terms, for example. So once it converges, the u out front and the u in the first derivative will be the same. So the nonlinearity still exists in the equations, 
the converged solution will take into account that nonlinearity, so the physical equation itself is still nonlinear. The other thing I want you to be clear on is the motivation for upland downland differencing is purely numerical. It's simply to enhance the diagonal dominance of our finite difference scheme. Sometimes it's presented as if it's motivated physically. If the fluid is moving in a certain direction, you use backward difference, forward difference, and so on. That's just a helpful way to remember which one you use. But the fundamental reason why we use this approach is to enhance the diagonal dominance so that we can iterate to convergence without concerns for it diverging. Now you will have noticed the primary disadvantage of this approach, and that is that it is only first order accurate because we've used these first order accurate forward and backward differences in those derivatives in the convective terms. So we've reduced the second order accuracy to first order accuracy. We'll address in a moment how we can restore second order accuracy, but let me first show you the consequences of that first order accuracy, and it could be pretty dramatic. So let's take a 1D Burgers equation. So just RE times U du dx equals d squared U dx squared, just to keep things simple. If you go back to where we discussed the Taylor series foundation for these finite difference approximations, and you find the appropriate approximation using the Taylor series for the first derivative with a backward difference approximation, this is the truncation error. So this is the first term that's being truncated in order to get our finite difference approximation. And what I want to show you is if we include this term, which of course is not being included in the numerical solution, I want to show you the magnitude of this term that's not being included relative to the terms that are being included. So everything from this term will be included in red, so you can see. So I have my re times u du dx, re times u. Here is the first order accurate backward difference approximation and its truncation error. And that's equal to the second derivative of u with respect to x. Now you'll notice, however, that this term also has a d squared u dx squared. So let's take that over to the right hand side and combine these. So then I have re times the ui times the backward difference is equal to 1 times d squared u dx squared minus re over 2 delta x ui times d squared u dx squared. Now notice these two terms. This term is included in the equation, but this term is not. So let's take a look at the relative magnitudes of these two terms. Of course, the coefficient here is just 1. Here the coefficient is Reynolds number, which could be quite large, times the velocity, which would typically be an order 1 number, times delta x, which is usually relatively small. The point being, it would not be at all unusual for the magnitude of this term to be roughly equivalent to or even bigger than the magnitude of this term. So in other words, a term that we are not including, which would represent then an error, is of the same magnitude or even bigger than a term that we are including. So this is the fundamental problem. We call this artificial or numerical diffusion. So if you've ever heard that term, and it sounds kind of weird, what does that mean? Diffusion is a physical phenomenon. And what this is showing is it's artificial, it's numerical because this term is not being included. We call it diffusion because it's a second order derivative, which, which corresponds to diffusion. And of course, this all depends on the Reynolds number, the value of delta x, and the value of u as to whether that term that's not included is much smaller than or of the same order or much bigger than the one. Now there are two possible remedies to fix this. The first one is called deferred correction. The idea is as follows. If we go back here, if you take out the red term, which is not included in the approximation, you go ahead and calculate the solution for you based on your first order backward difference or forward difference approximation. Then, once you have the u, you can then calculate this term, including the derivative, and put that in as a source term to your equation, and that's a correction. It's called deferred correction because you're deferring the correction until after you've already got the solution. Get the solution, calculate the truncation error term, add that back in as a source term, and therefore you brought back your second order accuracy in space and time. Relatively straightforward to do, not much additional overhead in terms of computational cost, so that's a, a reasonably good approach. Now another possibility is you remember that we have other approximations for these first derivatives. We have second order accurate forward and backward differences. Why not use those? Well, we could, but they would not be compact in the sense that we have our i point, and if it's a backward difference, you would have i minus one and i minus two. If you have a forward difference, it would be i, i plus one, and i plus two. 
so it's no longer compact. We would have five points just in the x direction and not the three points that make a compact. Again, that's okay. We can deal with that. It's no longer going to give us tridiagonal equations to solve and so forth. What happens if my boundary happens to be right here? Things like this. But those details can be worked out. But the first approach, the deferred correction, is relatively straightforward. We don't lose the compactness of the scheme. And it, again, has very little computational cost. Now that's for u partial u partial x type terms. The dependent variable times first derivatives of that dependent variable. Picard linearization, very simple, very straightforward, and it works just fine. For other types of nonlinearities, we would use what's known as Newton linearization. You've probably seen Newton's method before for root finding, for optimization. This is the same idea. We are locally linearizing the equation, taking a nonlinear behavior and assuming that locally it acts like a linear function. So here's how that works in this particular context. Let's take the u partial u partial x term again from Berger's equation, just so you can see how this compares with the Picard linearization. So here's u times partial u partial x. I'm using a second order accurate central difference approximation just for illustration, which you see reflected here. Then in Newton linearization, the idea is as follows. We're going to use a truncated Taylor series for uij. So every point, we're going to use a Taylor series around it. And as long as we're not going too far from the point itself, we can truncate the Taylor series as the value at that point plus a small correction. The correction will be delta uij, for example. So the uij star here is the value of, in this case, the velocity, but whatever the dependent variable is. At the previous iteration, you add the correction, the next term in the Taylor series, delta uij, and that gives you the value of uij at the current iteration. This only works if the delta uij is relatively small. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So all we're going to do is substitute this in for all of our use, the three u's that you see here. So I have the uij star plus delta uij. I'm going to remove the two delta x in the denominator for now just to simplify my equations a little bit. Here's the ui plus 1j term. So that's now ui plus 1j star plus delta ui plus 1j. And then here is the same thing, but for i minus 1. The key, however, is if a delta term is small, here, here, and here, then whenever you multiply one delta times another delta, it gets even smaller, and so we can neglect it. So a delta times another delta, we can neglect. So we have this times this gives us this, for example. This times this gives this, for example. And if you go all the way through, do all those multiplications, but neglect when you have a delta times a delta, then you end up with this expression right here. Now let's eliminate these delta terms here, 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 and here. So what we're going to do is we know that delta uij is equal to uij minus uij star. So for example, the delta uij term here, we're going to substitute in uij minus uij star. And we'll do that for each of these deltas. So then that gives us this even longer looking expression. But notice what happens. This uij star times ui plus 1j star, that's the same as this term right here. This uij star ui minus 1j star, that's negative. That cancels with this term right here. And once we simplify it, remember that the star terms are all known. So in terms of the unknowns, here, 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 and here, there are no nonlinear terms. All the nonlinearities have been eliminated by Newton linearization. So we just have a number times a u, a number times a u, number times a u. So this then would replace the finite difference approximation for that u partial u partial x term. Okay, that's that first point right here. Of course, don't forget to put back the two delta x in the denominator when you put it back into your finite difference equation. Now the attractive thing about Newton's method and this is the case in whatever context, root finding optimization, is you get quadratic convergence rates, so fast convergence rates, if you have a good initial guess. But that requires that delta u be small, so you're not making too much of a jump from one point to the next. If delta u is too large, 
as is the case for any application in Newton's method, the method could diverge from the true solutions. So that's always the danger of Newton's method, but in this context where the delta u's are generally small, because delta u doesn't change much from one iteration to the next, we should be okay.